folks, you're going to be finding Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Now, I'll tell you, Judges is one of my least favorite books in the Bible. It really is. Um, in fact, I can't remember which chapter is it. It's later in the, in the book. Uh, oh, it has one of the most heinous acts of mankind that you'll read throughout Scripture. But you know what? That's what I love about this book. It's unedited. It's unsanitized. It is the story of depraved mankind and then the story of God's amazing grace that is greater than our depravity, right? Where sin abounded, what? Grace abounded all the more. I would say tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, you better believe that. But you just holler it. Listen. Judges, it was a period of time when uh, it, was, it was after uh, they've crossed the Jordan and gone into the promised land. They are in the process of possessing that land. Um, but it's before their first king, Saul. Remember, they whined and complained, said all of our neighbors have a king. We want one too. Be careful what you ask for, Right? So it's this period of time between there when God established judges. Samson was a judge. Uh, Samuel was a judge. So it's an interesting time, Judges chapter 6. In way of introduction, let me tell you a story from Acts chapter 23. What the context is, Paul has now been arrested for the sole reason of sharing his faith. The same Jewish leadership who executed Jesus, are now wanting to execute Paul. This is a holy war. Now, you've seen the intensity of those in history, right? And so Paul has been arrested. He has now testified in front of the Sanhedrin, that 70 uh, men comprised of Pharisees, Sadducees. He's now gone back to his cell en route to Caesarea, about, I don't know, 75 miles away there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to appear before Governor Felix and King Agrippa. So he's just finished with the council. He's gone back to his cell. The Jewish leaders go to a group of men and they tell them, we've got to kill this man. He's got to, we've got to finish this job. We can't let this go any further. You remember that through the Gospels, you know, when uh, we're told through, by all the Gospel writers at this point, they sought to kill Jesus. Well, at this point, sharks smell blood in the water, and they want him out. And so the Jews form a plan. Forty men make a vow. You'll find this story in Acts 23. You can go home and read it later. They make a vow that they will not eat or drink before Paul is dead. So the Jews, the Jewish leaders say, tell you what, go tell the commander to bring him back one more time to the Sanhedrin because we want to ask him some more questions. So while he's on his way back to the Sanhedrin, we'll ambush him and we'll kill him. And those 40 men said, so it shall be written, so it shall be done. They've made a vow. Paul's nephew somehow heard about this plan. It's Paul's sister's son. He's a boy. He runs to Paul and tells him the plan. Paul finds a Roman officer. He says, please take my nephew to the commander. Tell him what's going on. So he does. The commander then says, without question, we can't let this happen. And the officer tells the commander, look, you got 40 men, 40 soldier, battle-tested men who have sworn they will not eat or drink until this man is dead. And so the Roman commander said, I'll tell you what, we're going to head out tonight. And he summoned 470 Roman soldiers to escort Paul to Caesarea during the night. Now, what a story, right? What was that nephew's name? It's not even mentioned. For whatever reason, God didn't even convict Luke.
to record that boy's name. But if that boy, that seeming nobody, had not acted on the conviction that God had given him and summoned the courage and abandoned his fear, left that fear at the cross, look, Paul's ministry would have been done before he ever went on trial in Rome. Look, what does that mean? No letter to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to the Philippians, to Philemon. No letters to Timothy or Titus. What was that boy's name? (laughs) We don't know. But what I have found, and I want to point out today, is that God has a habit of using nobodies to further his kingdom. You ever feel as though God couldn't possibly use you? (laughs) Too many mistakes, too many bad decisions, not enough skill or talent. I can't get up there and speak. I can't get up there and sing. I, I just don't have much to give God. Oh, my. You know what it means? If you think that, it means you're completely normal. And according to the Bible, completely wrong. <laughs> it's interesting. Forgot all about my little clicker here. I only have a few slides. Look what the scriptures tell us. In fact, Paul wrote it. Just look at your own calling, believers. This is two Christians. Not many of you are considered wise according to human standards, not many powerful or influential, not many of high and noble birth. In other words, you're just common folk. No one would notice you. Your name's never going to be in the paper. But God selected. God has selected. Say that phrase. God has selected. For his purpose, the foolish things of the world, to shame the wise. And what? God has selected for his purpose, the weak things of the world, to shame the things which are strong. In other words, God works through people whom the world regards as nobodies. They're not self-reliant or self-sufficient. Instead, they are those unlikely believers who, when given unique opportunities for eternal impact, depend wholly on him, and as a result, his power and wisdom are on full display. That little boy whose name we have no idea, we don't even know his name. We saved Paul's life, which in turn altered destinies, and in in turn changed the course of history. Well, I wonder how many times you've done that. You never know, huh? Well, there are a lot of things we could do with this passage, but let's read it first. How about it? Let's look at an example of one of these nobodies. We're going to look at chapter 6 of Judges, verses 11 through 16. This is an outstanding, it's a gripping story of God's power on display. Look what it says. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, and belonged, that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, <laughs> harkens back to Moses and anybody else God asked to do anything, right? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened? This is a time of absolute misery. Why is God, why is all this happening to us? Why the pandemic? (laughs) Where are all his wonders that the fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of the Midianites. Lucky for Gideon, God ignored that. In verse 14, The Lord, you see it all capitalized in your Bible? That's the tetragrammaton. That's that four-letter Hebrew word for the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Uh, Tetra meaning four. Of course, gramma meaning words, Y-H-W-H. And so the reason I point that out is that because now we're told 
that that angel of the Lord is God himself. It's not a messenger. The Lord turned to him to Gideon and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand, and I am I not sending you? But, but Lord, <laughs> Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. He's saying, God, I, <laughs> I'm the runt of the litter. Surely you have the wrong number. And then fortunately for Gideon, God ignored that as well. And in verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Now let me give you a little bit of context to why Gideon is responding the way he is. Number one, he's surprised that God would even dial his number. But number two, this is happening between two periods of extended peace. You got 40 years on the front end. You're going to have 40 years on the other end. It's about 1100 BC, give or take. So the reason for this unrest is because Israel has once again exhausted God's patience. They've gotten full of themselves, they've forgotten him, they started worshiping idols, so forth and so on. And so how did God get their attention? The Midianites. The Midianites are described in Scripture as so cruel that Israel would run to the mountains. Their army, described in chapter 7, a swarm of locusts. The number of their camels, like the number of the grains of sand on the seashore. So... The reason that Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press is he's hiding out. The, the Midianites would come and they would let the, the Israelites gather the wheat and the Midianites would come and take it from them. Do you remember that Disney movie, A Bug's Life? Remember that? Remember when Hopper comes down and he's mad at the ants? He says, the ants gather the food, the grasshoppers take the food. <laughs> Well, that's what's happening here. And so Gideon is already afraid, threshing that wheat, looking out for the enemy. The least of his worries is the Midianites taking the food. The greatest of his worries is that they'll kill him and his family. Now, you read the rest of this story anytime you want. If we dealt with and addressed every biblical truth and implication, well, we'd be here all day. And believe me, we're not going to be. <laughs> Let's look at one single lesson, one single biblical truth from this passage. Let's unpack it together. In Judges chapter 6, beginning with verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Say mighty warrior. Well, now, this is Gideon who just said, God, you, you, you've, you've knocked, you have the wrong address. You've called the wrong number. <laughs> I'm the least in my clan. My clan is the least in the tribe of Israel or the nation of Israel. And then I'm the least. You, you can't possibly mean me. God, I get up every single morning. I look in the proverbial mirror. I see somebody who's the runt of the litter. I, what are you thinking? Does God make mistakes? No, he doesn't. He looks at Gideon and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So this is our lesson today. Neil Anderson is a respected author and theologian and counselor. He said, I have found one common denominator for all struggling Christians. They do not know who they are in Christ nor do they understand what it means to be a child of God. But God looks straight at Gideon, and seeing Gideon as God intended for him to be, he called him mighty warrior. Folks, we've got to embrace and embody who God says we are. Well, who does God say we are? Well, let's let God answer that question, shall we? In John chapter 1, verse 12, we're told, I am a child of God. In John 15, 15, 
I am God's friend. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, I am a member of Christ's body. In Ephesians 1, 1, I am a saint. I'm Saint Nick. <laughs> Listen, saints aren't something out of the Roman Catholic Church. Man, we are we have been given sainthood through this amazing grace, this blood of Christ that tore that veil in half from top to bottom and gave us immediate access to the Holy of Holies. That's who you are. Now, right now, I'm going to tell you what's happening in the spirit realm. Satan is trembling because the possibility exists that you'll walk out of here and all of a sudden you'll understand possibly for the first time who you are in Christ. Now you become dangerous. In Philippians 3.20, I'm a citizen of heaven. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, I am God's temple. In Ephesians 2.10, I am God's workmanship. I am his masterpiece. And then in Philippians 4.13, you know the scripture. Say it with me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Somebody has say amen. Folks, that's who we are. And that's what God is telling Gideon. That's who you are, son. Now, as human beings, I know we're a mess. But in Christ, we are a perfect mess. His righteousness imputed to us through his death on the cross Back when I was in youth ministry um, for about 110 years, um, we had a, a document circulated called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. What I've done is I've taken that and I've modified it a little bit. Let me read it to you what I've written. I am a child of Almighty God. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I live by presence. Lean by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the presence of adversity. Negotiate at the table of the enemy. Ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of the risen Christ. I am led by his word and sealed by his Holy Spirit. Satan's knees knock when I pray. The halls of hell quake when I share my faith. And demons tremble when I speak the name of Jesus. I am protected by the great shepherd. I'm healed by the great physician. Comforted by the prince of peace. And redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Because of the cross and the empty tomb, <laughs> there's now no condemnation put upon me for my condemnation was put upon my blessed Savior. I'm completely forgiven. My sins washed white as snow. I am 100% righteous, 100% holy. I am a disciple of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hear him roar. Woo! Selah. Pause and think about that. I'm already at my conclusion. Oh, Gideon. Your entire life, Satan's whispered in your ear that you're insignificant, good for nothing, a nobody. Gideon's forgotten that faith only works in the present. Do not miss what I just said. Faith only works in the present. This is why the enemy tirelessly tries to get us to live in a state where we continually regret the past and fear the future. Do you get that? That will change your life. So when the righteous shall live by faith, that Paul quotes from Habakkuk, comes to mind, faith only works right now. But what if, no, 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 that's, ne that's tomorrow, that's the next day, that's later. The righteous shall live by faith, and faith 
only works in the present. Read your Bible, all 66 books of the canon of Scripture. You'll find that God has a habit of picking up nobodies and making them somebodies. What was that boy's name who saved Paul? I look forward to meeting him one day. Look, folks, God's already written you into his story. But it's up to us, right? How we respond to God says everything about what we believe about God regardless of what we say. In other words, it's up to us. If Noah had said, Lord, I, people are going to laugh at me for building this boat. It's never rained. I, I'm afraid of what they're going to say about me. I just soon do my own thing. Would God have said, okay, well, I won't flood the earth. I'll think of something else. <laughs> no, Noah would have been drowning with the rest of them. He would just got someone, someone else who made themselves available. It's not our ability. God has no interest in our abilities because what he's going to ask us to do is beyond our abilities. Otherwise, we might even brag about that, right? No, because if we can explain it, God didn't do it. God just wants us to humble ourselves and say, Lord, use me. Tell me what to do. And Lord, please give me the courage to follow through. And it all starts, at least in this story with Gideon, with understanding who we are in Christ. Understanding and embracing our identity as a believer a blood-bought disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at one nobody in history as we finish this up. It's a fascinating story. This is Annie Florence. She went by Flory Evans. I can't believe I found a picture of her. But that tells you <laughs> what this seeming nobody meant or meant to her story because you can still Google her and read these fast. And by the way, if you ever have a chance, just begin to study some of the great spiritual awakenings and revivals of the last several hundred years of history. So it was 1904 in New Quay, Wales. I, Michelle and I have been to Wales, went there in, in college. Our choir went to England and Wales and did ministry there and sang concerts. It's beautiful. It was one Sunday after the evening service, and the pastor, Joseph Jenkins, was visiting with those who wanted to stay around and visit. So you can picture that. It's a Sunday night. People have left. Some people want to stay. Isn't that awesome? We've been in those services. People just hang around, and we talk, and then we go to Brahms, and, you know, do that sort of thing. You know how it is. The other day, Michelle and I, wasn't Friday night, went to Brahms. They asked me what I wanted. I said, I'd like two banana splits. I'd like one to eat, just one just to rub all over me. <laughs> That's when the man with the handcuffs came out. And... But it was a Sunday evening, and these mostly young people, mostly students, right about your age, they were hanging around, and they just wanted to talk about some of the things the preacher had said. So as they sat around, Pastor Jenkins just said, I have a question. What does the Lord Jesus Christ mean to you? Well, that's a good question. Well, one bright young man put up his hand and volunteered. He's the Savior of the world. And the boy was quite correct in what he'd said, but it was not what Pastor Jenkins was looking for. He was looking for evidence of a heart experience of Christ rather than a mere head knowledge about him. So he repeated the question with extra emphasis on the last word. He said, let me ask that again. What does the Lord Jesus Christ mean to you? Flory was 19 years old. She had not been a Christian long, and up until this time, she had certainly not been bold about her faith. So following the pastor's question, there was this brief moment of silence as people grappled with the question. You know how it is. Everybody's head goes down, and they're thinking... 
And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, I want to think, whispered in the ear of Flory, stand up, Flory, and tell them what I've told you to tell them, mighty warrior. She stood up humbly, without drama, from the prompting of the Holy Spirit within her, and she announced simply and sincerely, quote, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart, end quote. That was it. There was a holy silence for a short while as the words and the significance of quite how they had been expressed sank in to the people who heard her. Then, around the room, like a mighty rushing wind, some of the listeners began coming under conviction. There was the quiet sound of sobbing, first from just one or two, and then more generally as the Holy Spirit worked deeply in the hearts, bringing revelation of the closeness and the depth of God's love expressed to each one through the person of Christ. The aftermath of Flory's sudden declaration of love for Jesus was the central spark for the 1904 Welsh Revival. Do you remember that movie Independence Day? Will Smith, and remember the aliens? You remember how those huge spaceships, they, they were lining up for an attack and they, they were over the, the White House and it was over the uh, Eiffel Tower and all across strategic places. And there was one in, uh, in L.A. over this tall building. And do you remember what happened? When, when the countdown got down to zero, the little, looked like a a camera shutter, began to open underneath, remember? And that laser, do you remember? And it just went, that's what happened. I want to be a part of something like that, folks. I've seen it happen, but I want to see it take over the United States of America. Why not? Begin with, it's got to start somewhere. Why not Bacon Heights in Lubbock? We're not going to brag about it. We know it's not us. But what if God is looking at Bacon Heights and saying, oh, I'm with you, mighty warrior. So the newspapers got a hold of this and spoke of a, quote, Powerful religious revival among the young people of New Quay. What a nice, refreshing headline that would be today. Moving from the riots, it appears in Lubbock, God is working. Within six months, folks, 100,000 people had placed their faith in Christ. Newspapers, newspapers, I'm not done, were dedicating full columns to lists of names who had come to Christ. People were heard saying, quote, the fire of heaven has set itself upon the nation of Wales. It was an outbreak of God. It could not be contained. The gates of hell would not stand against it, and it spread throughout the nation. Some estimates cite 250,000 people came to Christ through faith over the next few years. And finally... Historians estimate that the Welsh revival of 1904 prompted 30 other similar revivals throughout the world. (laughs) What was that boy's name? (laughs) Don't miss this. The context was not a huge event held in a packed stadium or auditorium. There was no celebrity preacher or speaker, no big steak night where we got together and called in a big crowd and sat down. Nope, just a 19-year-old girl who made herself fully and wholly available to be used by the God of the universe, the God of the cross, the God of the empty tomb. And all heaven broke loose. So, let's go back where we started. 
A frightened and defeated Gideon told God, how can I save Israel? I'm, I'm the weakest, my clan is the weakest, I'm the weakest in my family. And God, in essence, says this to Gideon and to you. Give me your weakness and I'll give you my strength. How's that for a deal? So what happened to Gideon? Well, the entire story is quite fascinating. This runt of the litter, this nobody. Well, in chapter 8, after Gideon has won this great battle, as the battle was the Lord's, and by the way, the Israelites didn't have to do a thing, practically. The Midianites turned on themselves and ran for their lives. And so look what they did, as usual. This is our default. Gideon, you're awesome. We want to build a statue of you. Rule over us. You've saved us from the hand of Midian. Oh, no, 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 no. No, Gideon didn't save them from anything. If anything, he almost didn't take the job, right? So, but this time, though, Gideon had learned who God was, and the result, he learned who he was in Christ or in God. He said, I will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. That's sort of like Flory saying, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. The Lord will rule over you. So look what happened. Midian was subdued, this cruel nation that made Israel run for their lives. And it did not raise its head again. And during Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace. Peace and intimacy and fellowship for four decades. Chuck Swindoll, uh, in a biography on Moses, he said, for 40 years, Moses was a somebody. For the next 40 years, Moses was a nobody. <laughs> For his last 40 years, God showed Moses what he can do with a nobody. So we come to this time of response, right? Some of us came in here today with anxiety, fear, indecision, not understanding our identity in Christ. Well, hopefully... The Lord has taught us all something today. He's taught me. He's reinforced to me, even as I prepared this message, what we just need to be reminded of. <laughs> We're children of the mighty king. We're disciples of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hear him roar. Well, one of the cries of um, the Welsh revival of 1904 was, Oh God, bend me. What that means is, God, break me, humble me, that my people who are called by name will humble themselves. Let me see who you are so I can then recognize who I am. Give me the courage to do what you're asking me to do. Well, that's good counsel, folks. Oh, I'm sorry, that's good counsel mighty warriors. Let's pray. Now, God, Lord, we have our two questions. What did you tell us today? And what are we going to do with it? Father, for anybody in here, God, who's never met you, oh, God, please, please don't let them leave until we have an opportunity to visit with them and introduce them to this lion of the tribe of Judah. God, help us to believe you, recognizing that faith only works in the present. And God, for those out there who came in with fear and anxiety, regardless of what it is you've, you've been nudging us to do, just as you were nudging Flory in that, in that prayer meeting, that discussion. God, whether to stand up boldly or to forgive somebody or to, to, to eliminate something from our lives. God, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is. God, we hear your voice now. I am with you, mighty one. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, folks.